This podcast may contain explicit language. Welcome to the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast, the show that uses a unique grading style to redefine what the greatest movies are. I'm Tom Duncan. And I'm Dana Duncan. Tonight, for our 209th episode, we discuss the baseball classic, The Natural, celebrating its 40th anniversary this week. Directed by Barry Levinson, written by Roger Town and Phil Dusenberry, music by Randy Newman, starring Robert Redford as Roy Hobbs, Paul Sullivan Jr. as young Roy Hobbs, Robert Duvall as Max Mercy, Glenn Close as Iris Gaines, with Rachel Hall as the young Iris Gaines, Kim Basinger as Memo Paris, Wilford Brimley as Populous Pop Fisher, Barbara Hershey as Harriet Byrd, Robert Prosky as The Judge, Richard Farnsworth as Red Blow, Joe Don Baker as The Whammer, Darren McGavin as Gus Sands, although he was uncredited, and Michael Madsen as Bartholomew Bump Bailey. Also John Finnegan as Sam Simpson. Recognition for this movie? The Natural was released on May 11th, 1984, making this its 40th anniversary. Many of the baseball scenes were filmed in 1983 at War Memorial Stadium in Buffalo, built in 1937 and demolished in 1988. All High Stadium, also in Buffalo, stood in for Chicago's Wrigley Field in a key scene. On a budget of roughly $28 million, The Natural would gross nearly $48 finishing number 15 at the box office for 1984. Reviews at the time were mixed. Roger Ebert called it idolatry on behalf of Robert Redford. However, his television collaborator, Gene Siskel, praised it, giving it four stars, also putting down other critics that he suggested might have recently read the novel for the first time. However, sports writers have been less mixed in their praise for the movie. James Berardinelli, praised The Natural as arguably the best baseball movie ever made. ESPN's Page 2 selected it as the sixth best sports movie of all time. Sports writer Bill Simmons has argued any best sports movie list that doesn't feature either Hoosiers or The Natural as the number one pick shouldn't even exist. The Natural was nominated for four Academy Awards, actress in a supporting role for Glenn Close. Yes, this is one of those where she's been nominated, I want to say like 15 (laughs) times and hasn't won. Cinematography for Caleb Deschanel, art direction for Mel Bourne, Angelo P. Graham, and Bruce Weintraub, and music for Randy Newman. The Natural currently holds an 88% among critics on Rotten Tomatoes, a 61 score on Metacritic, and a 3.5 out of 5 on Letterboxd. So, Dad, as we begin each week, what is your relationship to this film? That was between my sophomore and junior year of college i saw it at the movie theater in beloit i can't remember who i watched it with but i know there was a i went to the theater and actually watched it and i knew that afterward i thought it was a little a couple of the scenes were a little hokey with the home run and the exploding uh lights and such and i made a comment in uh the uh father of uh, one of my best friends who was actually my best man in my wedding just tore into me about how horrible I was for saying such a thing about a instant classic. I think my first time watching the film, I've mentioned before on previous episodes, including a few weeks ago, that I can't remember for whatever reason I was staying with my grandparents for a summer for like a week, maybe two weeks or something to that effect. And we had gotten a bunch of different movies that I was going to watch while they were at work or doing whatever. And amongst the Bond movies that we got from the library, I want to say The Natural was also in there. It was suggested by my grandparents of all people, and they're not huge like movie people. But this was one that I think they had appreciated at the time. So I think that was probably my first time watching it. To be honest, I think I've seen it now twice since, including the watch we did earlier this week for the movie or for the recording. And other than, gosh, probably the ending sequence and maybe a little bit of the beginning, 
there were long stretches in this that I just didn't, I completely forgot. I just didn't really remember a whole lot of the, about this movie, even though, as we've mentioned, there are several people who consider it possibly the greatest baseball movie ever made. I'm not sure I necessarily agree that it towers above the rest in the way that I think maybe Hoosiers does for basketball. I think that I have gotten a new appreciation on this current watch for a film that I think most of the probably the film bros on on X or the site formerly known as Twitter probably don't. I know that for the film community, this is kind of a mid-level movie, and I'm not sure that my opinion would necessarily raise it one way or the other, but I did come to a new appreciation of this, which we'll obviously get to as we kind of move along. So what is the movie actually about? Basic theme is losing focus, letting your, I don't know, your proclivities. In this case, it was always a woman pulling him away from what he was intended to do. His predilection towards sex, I guess, ultimately costing him the career that he thought he should have. I think that, in a way... The best sports movies, and I know I've recently potentially embarrassed myself on the Revisionist Almanac by repeatedly asking whether something is a sports movie. I actually think there is a definition of a sports movie, and there are some movies involving sports that don't necessarily fall within that category. But the best sports movies have certain criteria, and then the ones that exceed beyond just a run-of-the-mill sports movie, which is usually, for the most part, kind of an underdog type of story. You face the villain early in the movie and then inevitably overcome them by the end of the movie, that sort of thing. The best ones are about something more than just them overcoming that particular team. They're dealing with a particular aspect of challenge that it is to be an athlete or to be in organized sports. For example, Major League to me is about a bunch of people that individually that are really not supposed to amount to much, but collectively they seem to fit together and come to be better than the sum of their parts. Rocky, we discussed on our 1970s or top 1970s movies episode, how you didn't think it was necessarily a sports movie, but I thought it was the prototype of a sports movie where The movie is not about whether Rocky wins or loses the fight, but whether he can achieve staying in the fight for as long as he can and holding himself high that he could last among the best in the world. He would be an equal. He wasn't just some nobody who was trying to get into boxing. I think similarly, The Natural is about a lot of things that are not necessarily immediately apparent. It's not a an explicit movie. This is much more, I would say, a poetic movie in some regards because it's filled with a lot of imagery and subtlety and things that are behind the scenes. Specifically, and I know we're going to get into the nature of the mythical and having to do with other legends or mythology. Epics. Yeah, I I suppose epics would work. It's based on some other outstanding legends that we've all come to know. But similarly, I think that Roy Hobbs, while depicted as somewhat of a tragic figure originally in the book, comes to be almost a godlike character, our mythic hero, in in the same way that I think in a Western canon would depict a John Henry or a Paul Bunyan or Casey at the bat. It's one of these parable stories that we often tell to illustrate other things behind it. An illustration of this, I would say, is the way that Harriet Byrd, Barbara Hershey's character, is depicted earlier in the movie. Now, if you take it at face value, she's the Black Widow. She's somebody who's murdering athletes and... She just happens to come across Roy Hobbs, and she's probably had it in for the whammer, but she comes across Roy Hobbs, and he beats the whammer. Therefore, he's the one that ends up with the gun being thrust upon him. Yeah, but in fact, there is a scene where when he strikes out the whammer, she looks, and she looks despondent. Then she kind of glances over at Roy, 
and kind of has a wry smile. So that's exactly what took place. But if you read into that much more subtly, that could be a stand in for drugs or alcohol or basically any vice that someone with natural ability, and we've all seen it throughout sports. If you're a big sports fan, you've seen somebody who's extremely naturally gifted never end up panning out because they got distracted. They didn't have to work as hard, so they don't necessarily take on the honing of their craft in the way that somebody who's only maybe 75% as talented as they are goes that extra mile to improve and really work on their technique and do all of these things. Yeah, but uh, part of this is, is two-faceted. Both are come from the same place, which is overcoming an obstacle. There's those that are created and imposed on you. Uh, and I'm drawing a blank as to the name of the film, but it was the uh, film about with Dennis Quaid, uh, where he's the high school baseball coach and he was a former major leaguer who hurt his arm. And all of a sudden he makes a comeback and ends up with the Rays, the rookie. I believe it's from 2003 and it was a Disney movie. Okay. And that film, it's his injury is the obstacle he's overcoming. This is a film. The other aspect is not just things that occur to you that you overcome, but some of them are your mistakes or your self-created traps or pitfalls. And that's what this movie comes to sense or comes to really uh, exemplify, which is that he made a choice to go and even though he was supposed to have been in love with Glenn Close's character, he was attracted by Barbara Hershey and her beauty and whatever. And there was a price to be paid for it. And then ultimately it's the same thing with memo at the end of the film as well. That pulls him down again. Now, the reason that I make this point is you're kind of highlighting it for me. All of the noted pitfalls usually have to do with women in this movie. You have a little bit of the allure of money with the Burns character, the gambler, which given that this is in 1984, to have somebody that explicitly part of fixing games and part of the, the baseball lore, allegedly in a period piece about the 50s or 60s, I would guess, I thought was a little unusual to include unless this is somewhat of a fictitious parable of the pitfalls or the traps of having natural gifts. But you're illustrating that the women, for the most part, are highlighted as the number one pitfall. But again, I would also say you could apply that to just about anything. An athlete example that we can bring up, Josh Hamilton, former multiple MVP of the American League, helped the Rangers get to consecutive World Series but he just had so much of a problem with drugs and alcohol that he could never realize his talent until he got into the exact right situation with the right manager to be able to help him stay on the wagon and realize his ability. And even then, when he signed with a different team and he changed his circumstances, he again just could not line up the right circumstances to be able to have that level of success that he could have had just based on natural ability. So I think there's a lot more to dig into the themes of this film than is on just on the surface level. But I do think you can still enjoy the movie, even if you don't want to dig into that stuff. It's not just a baseball movie. It's a, it's a theme of overcoming obstacles and consequences for our actions and decisions. And it could be set in any world. It could be Wall Street. It could be a medical movie, whatever it is, it's ultimately set in baseball and it, the themes are greater than the underlying story itself. So obviously with The Natural being somewhat of a fantasy, fictitious movie about baseball, is there anything really in the movie, though, that you would say feels more grounded 40 years later? I think our understanding of addiction and attraction and falling from grace are more prevalent in today's society. A lot of the stories are more open. Even back in the 60s, the amount of alcoholism that was running rampant through baseball and some of the great baseball 
players of the era, such as Mickey Mantle, were <laughs> were hung over for most of the games, and it wasn't discussed or thought of or or made part of uh, general discussions or anything else. That not has become more common knowledge, so we understand the difficulties and all of the other underlying circumstances that were taking place uh, much easier. So to understand what was happening to Roy at 19 and then again at 36 is a little more obvious and more clear now than it would have been even in the 1980s. I think part of what's grounded about this is you can empathize with somebody trying to break in at an older age. You can talk about the life situations of finally realizing when you have natural ability, all the opportunities and things that opened up to you, such as fast women, fast cars, lots of money, people wanting something from you. And I think we've become a little bit more open to a lot of those things as we see behind it. And we don't just simply worship our sports heroes in a way that we used to. But the other thing is, is I think we've been provided more life examples. It's one of the ways in which I think this film has actually aged pretty well. For every Peyton Manning of natural ability, there is a Ryan Leaf. <laughs> yeah. Well, because it's not just natural ability. Exactly. It's the circumstances and it's your inner fortitude, your ability to manage your reaction events plus circumstance equal outcome or your reaction equals outcome. And in this particular case, you're talking about even though people with the same ability, they are given a load of different experiences and some of them they're able to overcome because of their either their ability, their psychology, or they're given lesser circumstances so they can thrive more. And I say this as we're coming through the NFL draft. We, the talk is, is that, you know, six quarterbacks taken in this draft. And the, you and I were, you know, as a discussion, we're going through all of the different quarterbacks that were drafted over the last decade. And what is it, about only 35, 40% of them are even serviceable, let alone stars? I would say that it's about one out of three is a passable starter. Stars are probably only about one out of every five. Yeah. And I mean, these are guys who have just tons of talent. And we have guys who are paid millions of dollars analyzing these players who have to decide this. And even then, there's such a high failure rate. And it only leads me to believe that your support system, your environment, the things that are put around you have almost as much to do with your success as your natural ability. And I think no more is that apparent to me, again, looking at modern examples, than Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods had a lot of natural ability, but he had honed his craft through just meticulous levels of practice and almost obsessive behavior under the tutelage of his very overbearing father and mother to the point that he was a golf freak. But the minute his father passes away, and he loses some of that under-thumb type of tutelage, is about the time where he gets married, he starts having kids, and he really lets his life spiral out of control. And that kind of became the tragedy of Tiger Woods. Now, he's been able to realize some of his ability again, but I think that you could really see some of the downfall, the piercing of the armor when he wasn't under the guise of his father anymore. Similarly, in The Natural, when he goes away from his home, when he's been able to have opportunities for money and women and things that he's never had before, he makes some mistakes, and even then, he's only able to resurrect maybe a half a season of good actual baseball and help them win a pennant, potentially, but in a way that he... He can't after this short stint in the majors. He never quite gets beyond other this this flash in the pan. It, it all comes down to circumstances. And, you know, you look at the situation, and I've thought about this for myself. I have cousins who are about the same age as me. And why is it that I succeeded 
I would say I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I've done pretty well for myself. I think by the standards of society from a financial and I would say legal standpoint, as a lot of people that you happen to be related to or grow up with are not necessarily all on this side of the law. Correct. But again, why did I succeed whereas my cousins didn't? In part, it was the fact that my mother was a stabilizing force. She made sure I was taken care of, that I was watched over, that I wasn't allowed to be involved or influenced by th negative things, things that were inappropriate for a child, whereas my cousins were not. So they I let didn't... you get away with a whole lot. You've even said as much that you got away with a lot more than you should have, like watching certain comedy shows when you were of an inappropriate age. But that being said, your mother also did make my grandfather give up alcohol and he basically had to quit cold turkey. So he was pretty moderate within a certain line while she was around. So I yes. think if you're talking about a stabilizing force, being able to stabilize your household has a certain effect that the others I would be almost assured did not quite have. Correct. Because uh, my uncles drink uh, very heavily until they um, reach their demise. But again, that I think that's part of the whole rationale, which is, there's some sort of influence that allows you to succeed where others do not. And that's part of this whole story. And I guess I'll finish this point up with saying that I've been of the opinion for a long time that nobody actually gets to anywhere by themselves. You might have all the talent in the world, but a stable support system is necessary for you to have a successful outcome. Trying to just do it by yourself will always end in some sort of tragedy, whether you like it or not. I think there are enough people in the world that seem to think, think that they can just pull themselves up, but it's usually you're raised by a village, you pull yourself up by a village, you need something else to keep you going. And mutually, you can be a part of that to support other people, but that's why communities form. And I believe as much as I do in community growth as opposed to individual growth. So are you ready to go further into this movie? Do you have our plot summary ready for us? I do. The Natural, directed by Barry Levinson and based on Bernard Malamont's novel, is a cinematic ode to the enduring spirit of baseball and the human capacity for redemption. Roy Hobbs, portrayed with a blend of innocence and determination by Robert Redford, emerges as a mythical figure in the world of baseball. After a fateful encounter derails his early dreams, Hobbs resurfaces years later, wielding a bat that seems touched by fate itself. His journey with the New York Knights is a tale of triumph over adversity and of second chances and the pursuit of greatness amidst personal demons and external pressures. Through stunning cinematography and a score that echoes the heartbeat of the game, the natural transcends sports drama to become a timeless narrative of hope and the pursuit of dreams against all odds. Thank you. Did you know? The two eras of the film show Roy Hobbs at age 19 and age 35. Robert Redford was 47 at the time of filming. As I've put many times, while I can buy him as a 35-year-old in the film, they needed to have cast somebody in the age 19 role. It would have worked so much better. Did you know? While Darren McGavin had a major supporting role as the bookmaker Gus Sands, he received no credit. In the recent retrospective documentary on the special edition DVD of this movie, Robert Prosky claimed McGavin was cast late in the picture and would have received a lesser billing than the other stars. Thus, McGavin chose to go uncredited. Prosky noted where McGavin wound up, quote, drawing more attention to himself, as a result. Did you know? Hobbs breaking the scoreboard clock with a home run was inspired by Bama Rowell of the Boston Braves doubling off the Ebbets Field scoreboard clock on May 30th, 1946, showering Dixie Walker with glass. Though he'd been promised a free watch by Bulova for hitting the company's scoreboard sign, Rowell had to wait until 1987 to receive it. <laughs> uh. Did you know? 
The quote by Roy Hobbs about what it takes to be a big leaguer, you have to have a lot of little boy in you, was actually a quote by Brooklyn Dodgers, do you have it? Pee Wee Reese? Catcher Roy Campanella. Oh. Did you know? While the story is an adaptation of the book by Bernard Malamud, the plot has been changed for the movie to be more uplifting. Several characters and symbols are heavily influenced by the writings of Homer and Greek mythology. Roy Hobbs equaling Odysseus, he is trying to find his way home. Max Mercy equals Vulcan, god of fire and forging. He can make or break you and is always seen in red or brown clothing. Pop Fisher equals Zeus, king of the gods. His uniform is number one, and both the oak tree and lightning bolt, a la the Wonder Boy bat, are his symbols. The judge equals Hades, god of the underworld. He is always in the dark, aka death, and the dead are judged in the underworld. Memo Paris equals Calypso, a sea nymph who had an affair with Odysseus and held or distracted him from returning home. Calypso means I will conceal in Greek. Gus Sands equals the Cyclops. Gus has the one strange eye. Iris Gaines equals Penelope, wife of Odysseus. Roy's true love from whom he was separated for 16 years while she raised their son. Hubris equals when Roy states his goal is for people to say, there goes Roy Hobbs, the best there ever was in this game. This is what the Greeks considered to be hubris, excessive pride in oneself. And for that, a person would often suffer turmoil. And so with that, we'll take our first break and we will be right back. Before we jump back into the episode, next week for our 210th episode, we welcome Andrew Corns of the Revisionist Almanac on to discuss a movie title that we've all become more familiar with over the past eight years, but you likely haven't seen. Gaslight from 1944, directed by George Cukor, written by John Van Druten, Walter Reisch, and John L. Balderston. Music by Bronislaw Caper. You won't want to miss that one, so watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. Dad, we left off at Best Performance. Who do you have down? I have Robert Redford for Best Performance. As do I. I just thought he uh, by far had the most dominant part in the film and was the most the most impactful. I thought his, this is one of his better performances as an actor. Because I thought there was a lot of subtleties to his character. I had him not only as best performance, but most charismatic. I think the weight of the entire movie rests upon his shoulders. There's nothing particularly exceptional for me when it comes to most of the individual actors. I don't think anybody is necessarily head and shoulders above anybody else, with the exception of two, which I have nominated here. I think they're all good character actors, but nobody's necessarily giving a showy performance. There isn't anything that I think is all that layered. It's kind of standing and blocking and doing the basic stuff. I think the movie works as a whole, but it's basically sold on the premise of Robert Redford being a Hollywood star. I don't think the direction or the screenwriting is necessarily all that wonderful in its execution. It's just to me a vehicle for Robert Redford to be a Hollywood actor and make a movie that is number 15 at the box office in his, I would say, dwindling star era where he's at the tail end getting towards 50, even though now, you know, into your late 50s, early 60s is when most of these guys are becoming action heroes. <laughs> yeah. So I had him as best performer because I think by leaps and bounds, he is the one doing the most even though I wouldn't say that his performance is all that showy either or necessarily something extraordinary. I just think he's carrying the most for the movie. But if I were to have somebody that would have competed for a close second, it's probably Glenn Close. While a lot of my relationship growing up with Glenn Close was playing Cruella DeVille in the 90s <laughs> in the live action version of 101 Dalmatians. Woof, woof, and, woof. and I know you're just giggling along. There is clearly a great actress inside of every performance that she seems to give, with the exception probably being Hillbilly, Hillbilly Elegy. Elegy. Yeah. And even then, I still think there are good parts to what she's doing. It's everybody else that just is dragging everything down. But I certainly would not have wanted to have been nominated for that particular film, and yet she is. 
I still think she should have won over Olivia Coleman as much as I love Olivia Coleman for the wife over the favorite. Just my yes. personal opinion. I know. But we will let revisionist almanac relitigate the Oscars. That's not for us to say on this particular program. But I think that she is somewhat of a saving grace in this. She's the stabilizing force that we were kind of generally discussing in our opening segment. And while she is obviously made to appear angelic in the movie, she has a good amount of life lessons to bring to somebody who seemingly has lost their way. And so by the strength that she exudes, while not necessarily knowing all of the answers, but having a certain amount of life experience and wisdom provides a good lightness to the film to balance out a lot of the negativity and all of the toxic nature that Roy is constantly surrounded by, whether that's the circumstances with the Knights or the dour attitude of Pop or the stadium crumbling around them or just the circumstances of playing regular season baseball over 162 games, I would guess at that point, or his relationship with Memo or Gus and his gambling or the judge wanting to take full control of the team, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. She provides somewhat of a good-natured person to rally around and given as much as he's kind of fallen back into familiar habits breaks him out of not only his slump but I would also say out of his fog and remembering what is actually important in his life. So for that I have her as my best secondary. It's a 154 game schedule. It depends on which year you were talking about. If we're talking that this is potentially in the 60s, if you're talking 61 or later, it's 162. No. This is in the this is set in the late 40s, early 50s. It's 154. Okay. I I don't know if we established the year necessarily, but okay. Well, the novel was 52, and it was based upon a story that emanated from the 1946 or 47 season. Well, for what it's worth, allegedly within the screenplay, at least as it appears online, it's from 1939. So yes, you would be correct. Okay. For best secondary performance, I also had Glenn Close for almost the same reasons you indicated. She's kind of the voice of reason as everything seems to be about money and having a good time. She's the one that is the good person raising the son, having a normal job, trying to rally Roy when he needed help. She's playing a character that's cross grain from everything else in the film. And she does it in a very subtle way. I guess that more than anything is what I enjoy about Glenn Close's acting. She understates every role. With the exception being Cruella DeVille. Well, that one, yeah, because she that had one required go, less, almost no subtlety. Yeah, she had to go overboard opposite of subtlety because of the nature of the film. But for the most part, she's always playing these very subtle characters. And as a result, it looks so natural and so clean and well formulated that you're drawn to her naturally. So I think for the most part, again, as I've indicated and, and based on what you said, she, she had the best secondary performance. It's clear why she was nominated. So I think uh, I think she did a phenomenal job. As for most charismatic, you've already given yours. But for me, I went with one of the great character actors of the time, Wilford Brimley, who basically rose to fame with this film and kind of set himself up for a decade is being the curmudgeon, the crusty old guy who's commenting and complaining and whatever. The only thing missing from this was him yelling about getting off his lawn. But he had a run of films in the 1980s and early 90s that was pretty phenomenal. Really left a mark in a very hot but limited period of time. I'm sorry, the only other thing other than the diabetes commercials that I remember Wilford Brimley doing is The Firm, where he was a law firm's bodyguard, <laughs> supposedly running to catch up with Tom Cruise in his early 20s. Tom Cruise runs like the wind 
in movies in his 60s. How the hell is Wilford Brimley catching up to him in 1993? It is one of the weirdest castings I think I've ever seen. Although that movie is horribly miscast all over it. Yeah, well, he uh, he was also in Cocoon. Which I haven't seen. Well, I would answer a lot. There were other films from that era, and I'm just not stopping and thinking about them that he was in, but... Well, yeah, just obviously always you can him. look up his IMDb page. I but could. at the risk of potentially saying how many other films I have yet to see and anchoring, much like I did on our director pantheon last week, the ire of all of my film friends for the amount of things I haven't seen. Nothing makes you uh, recede further into yourself than knowing that you pale in comparison to people that you admire by the amount of movies they've seen, which is an obsessive amount. Yeah, well, you just need to be more sitting in a dark room by yourself watching flickering images. You mean more than the, uh, especially when I'm working from home, pretty much 24 to 72 straight hours that I already do? Yes, that's the only way you'll accomplish it. Because mm. if you have human interaction, you're not watching a movie. Well, so how do you explain someone who has uh, a family with at least two kids and has a full-time job, but somehow is able to watch like 800 films a year. Commercials? <laughs> uh, I'm sure I'll draw ire for that one. Oh, especially because he'll be listening to this before he comes on next week. Guaranteed. Of course. Of course. Let's move to best scene before we get too far away from the plot. <laughs> yeah. So I only have five. It was hard to pick five. I usually try to do five for our nominees and then let you kind of add in some more. But striking out the whammer, I have losing is a disease, which is that kind of montage when he's not playing. I have breaking the slump and seeing Iris, which I'll combine into one scene where he's at bat multiple times during that game. And he finally hits one and they win a game for once. And then they kind of have lunch together or something to that effect. I have the final refusal when he walks into the judge's office and hands him back all the money. And then I have the final at bat, which for a movie that was it like two hours and 17 minutes or something like that. I swear that at bat takes like 25 minutes. It is definitely an era of baseball from about the mid 2000s, maybe even 2013. The only thing Roy Hobbs didn't do was back out of the batter's box, adjust his helmet, restrap on his gloves three different times, adjust his bat, adjust his cup, spit into his hands, make sure they're rubbed all over, then re-spit into his hands, grab a little bit of pine tar from his helmet, and then get back into the batter's box only to announce himself and then call another timeout because his gloves weren't reapplied or strapped correctly. Obviously, that does not happen, but that at bat takes forever. So anyway, now that we've addressed all of that, are there any others that you would like to highlight that I missed? Yes, I would like to talk or do the scene, which is basically the overnight sensation, which is from when he finally starts hitting and the team starts rallying around him and he becomes an intricate part and the team starts its rise to prominence. I think that is a separate scene and I would like to have that no as a potential nominee. All right. So out of these six, then, what do you find to be the best scene? Breaking the slump. I mean, the scene with her standing up in the stands is a pivotal moment in the film. It's a reminder of his life of innocence when the innocence was going to lead him to be the best there ever was. And I just think the symbolism, the way the film is is portrayed everything about it just makes it such a pivotal and beautiful scene uh, i think it really is the heart of the film and kind of makes the both the beginning and the end much more meaningful in retrospect i see where you're going with it i don't have any disagreement per se i do think it's a pivot point obviously within the film and it's meant to be kind of separating I would say probably act two from act three in a four act kind of play. But for me, I have striking out the whammer because 
symbolically, in order to understand that this guy has immense natural talent, you have to believe that he's capable of not only standing with the giants of the sport and with the whammer being a very obvious reference to Babe Ruth, that he could on three pitches with almost very little effort strike out what many consider to be the greatest baseball player who ever lived. Being able to have a visual representation and the setup and payoff of that scene where it's simple in its conception, but allows you a window into what his natural God-given ability is, thus when it is taken away from him, it means that much more. The impact of the gun firing and him having lost his potential career only to come kind of wandering up out of nowhere into the dugout in the middle of a game in the middle of the season, it doesn't carry as much weight without that one pivotal moment early on in the film for me. Favorite scene? For me, it's overnight sensation. Just the the the, the scene where one of the players takes the lightning bolt, creates a patch and puts it on his uniform, and you can tell all the players now have a sense of purpose, direction, they're pulling together. To me, that is my favorite scene because I think that really shows how momentum builds in sports and how people start gravitating towards somebody who's really performing well and how one player or one person can make a huge impact in a particular group of athletes and really in general in a lot of different spheres in where success is built as a team. I have as both my favorite scene and the most indelible moment, the final at bat, and I'll shorten it even to basically the final swing when you know it's coming. And yes, there is a little bit of a anxiety with the whole thing. The length of the scene, while I made fun of it here a minute ago, does add to kind of the dramatic tension And I do think while it could have been a little bit shorter, you could have released it a little bit sooner. The fact that he does lengthen it out for that amount of time and Wonder Boy is shattering and he needs a new bat and he gets the new one that he created with the Bat Boy. So it has additional meaning and significance, et cetera, et cetera. Going to hitting the light and all of the sparks shattering because there's a chain reaction among all of the lights while it serves to be well beyond the mythical. And the reason why I don't find it necessarily hokey is because this movie isn't meant to be in the real, but rather a triumph of the human spirit and of good versus evil in a way that you would only get in a Hollywood production. Thus, this fanciful ending is somewhat befitting a movie that is about a fantasy. I think with the swell of the score... And the thing that you probably remember the most being that particular moment, it is my favorite thing about the movie, even if it takes two plus hours to get to that point. My most indelible moment is the the final at bed also. It's the part that everybody remembers, the part that I probably haven't seen it since. I'm sure I probably watched it with your mother in the early 90s one time but I'll bet you I haven't seen the film in 20 or 25 years. And that's the part you remember. I remember the, remember the whammer. I remember Iris standing up and I remember the final at bat. Yeah. I would say that equally, I remember Barbara Hershey's character. I remember the striking out of the whammer. I remember Glenn Close's character coming back, although I didn't remember necessarily Glenn Close, but just that character. And I remember him having troubles where, You think he could die and then having that final at bat where he's triumphant in the end. And the again, the swell of the music. So for me, coming out of that, where you have that kind of a Hollywood ending signifies that that is the thing most likely you're going to take away from this. So with that, we'll take our second break and we will be right back. Before we jump back into the episode, and before we get to the Stanley rubric in a minute, if you're ever curious about our Master Greatest Movies of All Time list that has every graded movie we've ever discussed on the show, there's a link in the episode description of every episode of this show, or you can go to ronnieduncanstudios.com backslash podcast and find it as the top entry on the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast show page. 
That has the grades we've done so far for all 191 movies we've graded, and we continue to add more each week. Make sure to check that out as we go and follow along. Also, you can follow each individual episode on our website as well. That has the notes for every individual episode with all of our scores, category nominations, and the individual factoids for each episode of this show. Just click the link in the episode description of this episode or go to RonnieDuncanStudios.com backslash Gmote podcast to find that. Dad, do we have anyone to remember this week? Yes. Zach Norman, 83, American actor and stand-up comedian. Romancing the Stone, Ragtime, and Cadillac Man. And apparently, I was reading this earlier today, he did some stand-up comedy early in his career before he'd kind of become an actor. He was on The Carson Show in the late 60s. Marla Adams, 85, American actress, was in The Young and the Restless, The Secret Storm, and Splendor in the Grass. Was an Emmy winner in 2021. Terry Carter, 95, American actor, Foxy Brown, McLeod, Battlestar Galactica, and he goes all the way back to the Phil Silver show in the early to mid-50s. And so we remember these here fondly for their contributions with a moment of silence here in their honor. Thank you. All right, let's do the horrible transition to best funniest lines. I will start. I don't think there's too many particularly funny lines in the movie, but maybe a few that uh, carve some additional meaning out. Iris, you know, I believe we have two lives. Roy, how? What do you mean? The life we learn with and the life we live with after that. Roy Hobbs, I guess some mistakes you never stop paying for. Roy Hobbs, pick me out a winner, Bobby. Pop Fisher. You know, my mama wanted me to be a farmer. Roy Hobbs. My dad wanted me to be a baseball player. Pops. Well, you're better than any player I ever had, and you're the best goddamn hitter I ever saw. Suit up. Roy Hobbs. I could have been better. I could have broke every record in the book. Iris. And then? Roy. And then? And then when I walked down the street, people would have looked and they would have said, there goes Roy Hobbs, the best there ever was in this game. Roy Hobbs, my life didn't turn out the way I expected. All right, my last one, Ed Hobbs. You've got a gift, Roy, but it's not enough. You've got to develop yourself. If you rely too much on your own gift, then you'll fail. And just so that we have something funny, Max Mercy, you read my mind. Roy Hobbs. That takes all of three seconds. You ready to move to the Stanley rubric? I am. All right. Legacy is up first. Would you like to go first or second? Go ahead. So as far as the film industry on this one, I don't think it gets quite the level of stature of some of its peers from the 80s and into the early 90s. I think there are other ones that are held in a much higher regard. Even, I think, to a degree, Major League is probably a more celebrated film. It's certainly shown a lot more often than The Natural. I think this has faded a little bit more into time. There are certain people that really highlight this film comparative to other ones, but in a way that I think Hoosiers is probably a little bit more celebrated than this one because it celebrates more of a team aspect as opposed to the individual ups and downs of somebody with natural ability. And there is an, enough of an element of tragedy within this film. It's also a little bit longer to be kind of a easy cable watch. So because of that, and the fact that the AFI's 10 top 10, which we mentioned the AFI, the American Film Institute, quite a lot on this program, they didn't even include it in its top 10 sports movies of all time when they did the list probably about 15, almost 20 years ago. I have this as pretty much splitting the middle on a uh, legacy for a industry side of it. I have it at a 2.5. Now, public is really hard to judge. I know you like to incorporate, to a degree, some of the responses we often get from our colleagues at the office, or at least they're my colleagues. I think there were a few people that had seen it that raised their hands. There were a few people that kind of generally knew it, knew it to be a Robert Redford film. But the amount of people that had seen it, probably limited. 
I think even among film fans, this is probably one that's a little bit more limited. It's not one of the immediate classics. It's not Hoosiers. It's not Caddyshack. It's not Little Big League. Shout out to Acorns there. So I'm not sure where to come down on this one. Originally, when I started thinking about it, I have it as a three. But as I've been kind of talking through it, I could see myself going lower. So right now, I will have a tentative 5.5. I was at the 2.5 you were, but where I'm going to raise it a half a point is the broader sense of the industry, which would include sports, entertainment, sports writers, sports fans, sports casters, sports talk show hosts who like this movie more. The only thing I would push back in relation to that is, do you count those as part of the industry? Now, I I liken a conversation that I think we had with Caddyshack, where we said part of the industry was like ESPN quoting the lines during Sports yes. Center in the 90s. In a similar way, Bob Costas having a retrospective and interviewing people for Costas at the Movies on MLB Network probably about 10 years ago for this film. Is that promotion by the industry or is that more of the audience at large? Well, I, I would say it's more of the industry because they're the people that help generate and help promote sports movies, especially now that ESPN, for example, is in the production side of it, making their own sports documentaries and movies. And what really makes this kind of stand out as far as legacy is the comparisons between the natural and Kirk Gibson coming up to the plate in the World Series and hitting the home run and staggering around with his bad back. And so I had to give it a half a point higher for that. So I went with three for the industry. For the public, there is a significant difference between who's seen it and who knows about it. Because I've done this experiment a little bit, is to ask people films that Robert Redford has done. And you know, you'll get the real movie or the movie files who will or cinema files who will say things like, well, the sting and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And but the natural comes up a lot. And it's even by people that have not necessarily seen it. They've at least had some chance of seeing it and it has some memory. It's not like right in their wheelhouse as far as great films or most impactful films or films that they remember what they were doing and what they were, you know, who they were with when they were watching it, all this, but they do. So I went with a 3.5 for the public for a 6.5 overall. It should make the math fairly easy. It does, but I'm still deciding whether I, I want to reevaluate mine at all. I think I'm just going to stay with my 5.5 and average it out to a 6, but yeah, that feels fitting. I, I guess I don't have too many complaints there. All right. Impact and significance. Well, for me, for the industry, I went again with a 3. It got mixed reviews. I remember watching Siskel and Ebert. You know, and I, as I faithfully did during this time frame and uh, thinking Ebert really kind of over blew the uh, negativity of the film and thought Cisco was much more reasonable in his assessment of it. And were there parts of it that I thought were hokey? Yes. As I said earlier in the thing, there were things I commented about that I thought were a little overdone. But for the most part, it was a story that I enjoyed. And uh, I think that for those who really liked it, they liked it a lot. And for those who didn't, they were critical of it, but it wasn't like it was scathing. So I went with a three there, leaning more towards the, the upper portion than the bottom. For the public, I was kind of shocked at how little money it really made. I thought it was done or had made more. But then again, this is the age of HBO too. So it may have made quite a bit more money from people watching it on HBO. I can see this as being an HBO driven film for people to watch who didn't see it in the theaters. I still went higher than, than the average 
So I wanted the 3.5 at the time because it was a discussed film and it was something people were talking about at the water cooler. And it was something that those people that really liked it really liked it. So we're talking there about a 6.5 overall. So I too also have this graded up a little higher than my legacy. Although I guess you went with the exact same score, but at the time, I think this was a much bigger movie, even though it's a little bit more of a moderate success comparatively. 1984 is kind of an interesting year to look at, and there are a couple of films in here that we've already discussed or will be discussing coming up. The top two films or the top four films were all over a hundred million. There were two films that were far and away the biggest films of that entire year. Ghostbusters by far and away the number one, and then Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom being the number two. But right after that, over a hundred million dollars, you had Gremlins and Beverly Hills Cop. After that, you get kind of a grouping from about 5 to 12 that has a bunch of properties that we all know, but I wouldn't say were like huge mega hits in the way that those other films were. The Karate Kid, Police Academy, Footloose, Romancing the Stone, Purple Rain, Terms of Endearment, which was on its second year because it had come out earlier the previous year, but because it had won Best Picture, I'm sure it got an extra boost. Splash is at the end of that. And then there's kind of a drop off after that to the next set of films, which is where kind of the natural hangs out. So I can't really say from an audience perspective that it's it's nowhere approaching a five. I wouldn't even say it's a four where it's like finishing in the top maybe five to ten of a particular year, given how much box office draw it potentially had in comparison with what else was going on around it. I think it came out and it was number one at the box office, but I don't have anything to necessarily say that per se. So I think this movie kind of came and went. It had its people who really appreciated it. I think the more inclined you were sports wise, the more you enjoyed this film, but it wasn't necessarily for the average person in a way that I think other sports films were able to advertise themselves. And it was trying to capitalize on a sports movie craze that had kind of sprung up out of Rocky and then had kind of continued into the late seventies, early eighties before it kind of had its next manifestation of the late eighties, early nineties probably from about major league through I would say about the end of the Adam Sandler water boy kind of sports film era. So sure. there's nothing that indicates to me that Hollywood thought, Oh boy, this is something that we have to really get behind. They weren't planning any sequels, anything major. In addition to this, it made back its budget. It probably was successful, but it's a late stage Robert Redford career movie. It didn't necessarily catapult him to anything. Additionally, Glenn Close had already been in a couple of other successful films. Namely, she had been in The Big Chill the year before, and I think she had been her first nomination was for The Big Chill the year before a film we have technically discussed, but we have not released that episode. We've been holding it in perpetuity in case you know one of us falls ill or something happens on a particular week or we just get tired or something and I've just been holding it back. I forgot we hadn't released it. I originally came down at a three and a three, so I'd be at a six. I think for the sake of the math, I'll figure out how to get to a 6.5, I guess, from an audience share. I don't know if I could quite go to a 3.5, but I think maybe on an industry because, you know, there were at least mildly positive reviews for the most part. There weren't too many people that were like savage other than saying it was just kind of long and boring. And... <laughs> Maybe it gave Barry Levinson some additional opportunities. I'll go 3.5 in the industry and I'll match your 6.5. All right, novelty. Now, as people who have been more recently with us on several of our episodes know, I've been experimenting with kind of splitting this category as well. One half based on originality and the other half based on execution, because to be honest, that's kind of how I've been scoring it pretty much probably the last couple of seasons anyway. And now I've just come up with a more formalized version of that but it's based on a best-selling book that is somewhat obviously based on other myths legends and tall tales it adds a lot of additional hero stories and other things that we're kind of familiar with and centers it around at the time america's favorite sport i think obviously we'll get into some classicness that i think baseball has obviously lost its luster comparatively to football but I think that the originality on this one is not particularly high. I think 
it gets a little bit of an extra boost for me on the standpoint that I don't think there are a lot of other movies about somebody who's naturally gifted, doesn't necessarily have to try hard in the trials and tribulations of somebody that we might either revere or revile for either accomplishing and meeting what they were meant to be doing a la LeBron or somebody who completely and utterly fails to live up to their potential and their talent. And so I guess I will go a 2.5 on the originality point of it, kind of split the difference. However, on the execution, I think this is pretty run of the mill. I think the cinematography is pretty decent. I think some of the acting is okay. I think this is more about charisma than it is necessarily about individual acting performances. I think Redford's obviously had much better projects or much better performances and other things that came well before this, the sting and all the president's men, Butch Cassidy, etc. There isn't much to me also from like a directorial standpoint that Levinson is really putting his stamp on this. So I'm going to again, split the difference. I'll go at 2.5. I have a five for novelty. I'm higher. I gave this the biggest points up on novelty based on the fact that this is a film that was more about individual excesses and potential vices and their impact than any of the other films. There weren't really sports films discussing how the high and mighty, how the greats fell or failed to live up to their promise other than by events. You know, we have Pride of the Yankees with Garrigan and his ALS. We have When Fear Strikes Out, which um, was Jimmy Pearsall with Anthony Perkins playing that part where he has mental illness. Those are the types of stories where it was players overcoming events or circumstances that they had no control of which they had no control. This is a film where it's about individual choices and the ramifications. So I gave it higher points there. As far as specific, it's not that great as far as the screenplay or the the way it's done or anything that was, you know, the directing. There are parts that I think in looking over it could have easily been cut down another 15, 20 minutes because of some of the scenes that were left in and, and tightened up. Execution wise, I don't see it as that great. I went with a seven though for an overall novelty based on the comments I initially made as opposed to the latter portion. Okay, so that's a six average between the two of us. So kind of to recap a little bit, because I don't think I've been giving the averages. We had a six for legacy, a 6.5 for impact and significance, if you hadn't been following along, and now a six for novelty. Classicness. Well, for classicness, I guess I'll go first this time. And what I'm going to say on this is, is that, again, it comes back to the same point of the novelty, which is in a time where excesses, vices, addictions become more prevalent, and we see the inner workings of athletes and how they fall despite having immense talent and opportunities and circumstances. I think this was ahead of its time in portraying that on screen. And so I gave it points up. I went with an eight overall for classicness. I gave it points down because, unfortunately, the vice is women – but then again, this is a baseball film. It's not like you're going to have teammates who are women. And so it had to be portrayed to some extent like this. But it's still, and it's in an era where baseball was still a white man's sport, uh, at least the major leagues. So I had a little bit down from that. So that's where I came up with my eight. So let me pose a Additional question. Do you think this movie treats its women fairly? For the most part, they are plot devices. They are either there to ruin Roy's career, sidetrack Roy's career, or resuscitate Roy's passion for the game or focus on the game, etc. By substituting women 
as a catch-all for almost all of the vice within the film. Is it necessarily a film that ages well on the objective perspective of potential sexism that would persist in an, a movie made 40 years ago? Well, let's put it this way. You raised one Tiger Woods. And what was Tiger Woods' ultimate downfall was the excessiveness of his sexual conquests and his ultimate divorce. Um, that was a huge portion of it. It destroyed his reputation. So I don't think so. I don't think it's any worse than the other side of this, which is where we find women who are in positions of either acting or in sports or whatever, who also have their own sexual dalliances that ultimately disrail or derail their careers or the path to success. So while I understand we've been living in this male dominated world for a long time and it's perceived that way, I don't think it's necessarily out of place I think you could very easily have done this film with just the opposite direction and, you know, as more of a futuristic aspect or instead of a historical perspective, and it would have worked just as well. So I'm not sure it's just perpetuating the uh, male dominance per se, but really kind of putting it in a position where one of the ultimate disrupts people and causes problems is sexuality and sexual deviancy. Well, I, I have a problem with the term sexual deviancy because it places a connotation that there is a line where expressing yourself sexually for your desires is somehow a negative in a much more open and forgiving culture on sexual proclivity. So I, I don't know if I'd quite go that far, but that it can become obsessive, addictive. Yes, I could definitely go into that territory. And I know I'm splitting a bit of hairs, but I, I want to, because I raised the question, I want to be fair to how I'd phrase the question. I ultimately come down probably on the same side you do, I don't think it's necessarily unfair because it could be symptomatic of something larger. And while it's meant to stand in and be representative of a whole host of vice, it isn't out of the realm of possibility. We've seen enough people where they lose focus because or they become, I wouldn't say lesser athletes, but they just have different priorities when they have a family or they start really dating and they get into a relationship that could be potentially toxic. Anybody who's dated the Kardashians comes to mind. <laughs> we were talking about this last night uh, while we were playing trivia, and I made mention of uh, Tawny Katane, who uh, was in the White Snake videos in the 80s. She ended up marrying Chuck Finley, who was a all-star pitcher for the Angels. And that whole thing where she beat the Levantar out of him, and because he was afraid of being charged if he tried to resist, he just let her and she, he ended up being beaten black and blue. Either way, I don't necessarily hold it against the movie for the potential treatment of women, but I can definitely see where somebody might have an issue with it. I wouldn't agree if they had a major problem with it, but even as a minor issue, I thought it was worth raising. That being said, one of the few things that I find to be ill classic about this is as I mentioned before, baseball's place in captivating the sports landscape of America in a way that it did at the time. It's just not as front and central to our hero worship of sports figures in a way it used to. I would say basketball and football have usurped its place and basketball stars, namely LeBron and certain other great NBA figures are much more prominent than anybody that you'd find in the major leagues right now. The same with football. I think both of those have done a better job to create stardom in a way that we used to celebrate baseball players. Now, on the flip side of that, I don't find there to be anything particularly damning or cringy 
that we would normally ding a movie for in this category. And by a factor that it's 40 years old, and I do think it's, you know, worth at least revisiting or rewatching and that we are finding some value out of this. I would actually give it a, an additional point for some timelessness. Now, in our discussion, literally in the last three minutes as we've been discussing this category, I thought of a new point where we've actually raised other films where they've met the moment that we're living in right now. And as we continue to have athletes be dinged for gambling on sports, yes. whether gambling on their own teams, we just had someone from the Toronto Raptors be banned for life from the NBA for potentially fixing their own games or at least gambling on games they were playing in. We've had the Tim Donaghy scandal. We've had other things. And you cannot turn on sports television. Even the ESPN app is now invaded by every gambling metric on each individual game. You get the odds. You get the advantages. You get the handicaps for everything. As that becomes much more prominent, the entire story plot of Roy potentially throwing a game or being in on the fix and you having a potential gambler that's in cahoots with an owner directly and overtly becomes much more prominent. And I think this movie actually raises a little bit. So in the moment, I've decided to raise up from what I originally had at a 7.5, a half point down for baseball's lost luster in the popular culture, but a point raised for its timelessness. I will go an additional full point up for this movie's discussion of gambling and how much that will age well in the era of <laughs> DraftKings and FanDuel and ESPN Bet and all this other crap that's currently going on. So I'm at an 8.5. Okay. Reinstatement of how many players that were with the uh, Detroit Lions were found to have been on, ba on football games? Well, it was not necessarily on NFL games. I think they were betting on college football, but they were doing it within the team facility and got nailed with that because you're not supposed to be making even gambling on other sports within the team facility. They were basically on the team Wi-Fi within the facility and they got dinged for that. Yeah. All right. Well, I think 8.5 is reasonable. So, so you're going to meet mine then? Yep. So that's an 8.5 for classicness. Rewatchability. The likelihood that I'm going to put this on, like I'm not opposed to it, but it's got to be under the right circumstances. I don't think I've put this on of my own volition probably in about 10 years, but it's not something I'm opposed to. It's also not something you're just going to simply run across. I don't think anybody's clamoring on Netflix to turn on The Natural or Amazon Prime or Hulu or whatever else. It's not going to be in your suggested list of like old classic, great, fun rewatch movies that you could potentially have. You may find it occasionally, but I think you'd probably have to go looking for it. So I'll go at two that I'd probably put it on. It'd be something that if I were doing a project, doing a sports film re-ranking or, you know, what are the best sports films of all time? I'd probably go through something like this. Like if we ever went in a pantheon of sports movies or a genre specific pantheon, that sort of thing, kind of like we did with directors last week, I could see myself rewatching this very easily and not having too much of an issue with it. And that's why I would probably go a three that I would leave it on. Like if I have a specific project, I'm definitely going to leave it on, of course. And that's most likely the scenario under which I would rewatch this. But if I'm just casually having something on, depending on what part of the movie that you're in, I think there are specific scenes that I wouldn't mind rewatching for 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever else. And especially if we get towards the end of the movie where, you know, certain things are going to be happening. I, I think there are, way too many stretches in this that are long over broad could have been very easily narrowed. Obviously don't borrow any of Martin Scorsese's editors, but it tightened up significantly <laughs> and been made a lot better. So I have a five. All right. When I first did my numbers and uh, I adjust it as I have space between when I start and when we should broadcast, Really, I I like the film, and I remember most of it. Watching it every five to ten years is enough. I, I don't know if I need to watch it any more than that. I can think about the film, 
and enjoy the thoughts of it and the specific scenes without having to watch it again. So I, I don't really think it's all that rewatchable or it's something that I need to rewatch. I started out around the average of about a seven, but I'm going to drop it down to a six because, you know, I'm going to, if it's on, I might sit and watch it for a few minutes. If somebody hasn't seen it and we're talking baseball or something, you know, I may pop it on if I've got it or if it's available and watch it again. I'm not opposed to watching it. It's just nothing I'm going to necessarily go out of my way and feel that I have to rewatch or that it gives me so much pleasure that I need to rewatch this on a regular basis. Okay. So that's a 5.5 average between the two of us. To add in our audience score, we had a 59% for Google users. You can tell those are all millennials. And we had an 88% for Rotten Tomato users, giving us a 7.35. So to repeat the categories, we had a 6 for Legacy, a 6.5 for Impact and Significance, a 6 for Novelty, an 8.5 for Classicness, a 5.5 for Rewatchability, and a 7.35 for Audience Score, giving us a final total of... 39.85, and currently placing it on our list at number 163, between Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, ironically also from this year and previously being mentioned as a film ahead of it on the box office, and Zodiac at 164. I just thought about this. I should propose this and actually see if I can get some sort of a job in my retirement working for AARP magazine and do an audience score, basically the geezer score where it's only, you have to be a member of ARP to provide your audience score to a movie so that we have a different perspective. Go for it. I think I might just contact them and suggest it. If you disagree with any of our scores, you can certainly write us at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us at any of our socials at Podcast on X or the social media website formerly known as Twitter. I think we're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Letterboxd, as well as YouTube, so you can find us at any of those locations. Remaining questions. With the ending from the book and the ending from the original version of the script be different than what we have now, and would either of them have been more impactful? So to explain this, you apparently looked up what the ending of the book was, so you can uh, offer that now. So in the book... Roy takes the uh, bribe from the judge while he's in the hospital bed because Memo tells him that she can't marry him because he's broken. So he needs the money in order to have her. So he takes the money and he, he takes the money and he goes about doing the fix. So in the first at bat, he deliberately strikes out. In the second at bat, he walks, keeping his promise to not hit safely in line. The third time up, he deliberately fouls balls up in the stands. One of the balls ends up hitting Iris, who's been standing nearby. She's taken away by ambulance. Hobbs strikes out after that, but not before he splits Wonder Boy. And when hitting, has the new bat. The next time he comes up, Pop scans the bench, seeking a pinch hitter. Hobbs begs to let him go back into the game and to hit. He does, but he's changed his mind now about keeping his promise about throwing the game, and he tries to hit, but strikes out. Afterwards, Max publishes that the money was, to, the game was fixed, has pictures of him in the hotel room shot, He's absolutely, his his uh, reputation is destroyed and reminiscent of the Black Sox scandal. A boy employs to Hobbs, say it ain't true, Roy. And Hobbs, and this is the last line of the, the book, and Hobbs looks into the boy's eyes but cannot lie. He lifts his hands to his face and wept many bitter tears. And that's the end of the book. Now, having heard the entirety of that, I hate that ending. <laughs> yeah. It certainly would have made this film 
more critic palatable, but the rest of us would have turned this thing off immediately. Now, the original version of the script, which I do actually think might have been more impactful than the ending that we got, is as Roy rounds for home or whatever, he basically, his stomach explodes, as they keep saying, he scores, but ultimately dies on the field, that he becomes a sacrifice to the greater game of baseball. And whether you buy that that's additionally hokey in that moment, I still think the tragedy of Roy Hobbs is a lot more impactful than the really happy-go-lucky, he gets to play ball with his son ending that we did get. So for me, I would have preferred he pass away instead of the, I guess, more Hollywood iconic version that we got. But either version of that is certainly better than the just bleak, almost Michael Haneke level ending that we would have gotten from the book. Yeah, the book was much darker. Much, you think? Did you have any remaining questions? No, just one thing I happened to catch, and I just wanted to comment about that. Because Redford was left-handed, and he was used to batting left-handed. When he was preparing for the film, I found this ironic. He watched hours of video of Ted Williams and tried to emulate Ted Williams' stroke. His swing is almost verbatim copycat. I just thought that was interesting the level of deliberate planning and research that went into preparing for the role. All right. So time for everyone's favorite. All right. It is our ADAs or ask Dana anything. If you have any further ask Dana anything questions that you'd like to submit, we only have four of them left. So we would only be through the end of next week. So certainly get those in at any of our socials at GMOT podcast or to our email, greatest all time movie podcast at gmail.com. So, because we are in the midst of a baseball movie, I think this is somewhat fitting. This comes from our resident Cardinals fan from St. Louis, Mr. Andrew Corns. What are your favorite memories of the 1982 World Series? I can't give my favorite memory of the 1982 World Series. I try to keep this at least somewhat of a family show. Apparently a story I've never heard, and uh, I'm grateful for you uh, holding your tongue a little bit. (laughs) Uh, uh, Let's, yeah, well, let's just say, yeah, let's just say that uh, I I reached a a rite of passage during the World Series. Ah. (laughs) Uh, Anyway. I just remember, I mean, really for Brewer fans from the 82 World Series, it was a lot about coming from behind and winning the the pennant from the Angels leading up to it. We didn't have Raleigh Fingers. He had been such an integral part of the team. Most of us were thinking we were behind the eight ball to begin with. We had a chance, I guess that's what my biggest memory of that is, is that fact that we at least had gotten to that point where I never thought growing up as a Brewer fan, starting when they team moved to Milwaukee and going to the game, sitting on my dad's lap in 1970, that we'd ever get to that point. But I mean, I was such a avid fan that... Uh, I had my transistor radio taken away from me in in science class in eighth grade because I put the uh, transistor radio in my pocket, ran the earplug up my sleeve of my coat, and would sit in class with my hand over my ear in the ear pe- in the earplug in so I could listen to the ball game in the afternoon because they were playing day games to start in April. And I made the mistake of, I believe it was a grand slam home run hit in 78. I want to say it was by Larry Heisel off of uh, Joe Kerrigan of the Orioles. And I went, yes. And that's when I had my radio taken away until my parents wrote a release and said, my dad told me just to uh, be more careful next time. Wow. Parents who aren't overbearing. I wonder how that was. You knew how it was, at least on this end. 
yeah, but there was one voice that was much more ferocious and aggressive about any of those indiscretions because it reflected poorly on her. Uh, not going there. <laughs> Somehow or another, you're going to end up discussing this and saying it was me who made the comments. Anyway, our second question will be a little bit lighter. Arnold or Sly? Arnold. I think actually Arnold's a better actor overall. I think Arnold has more to say in general in all of his characters and his roles, even though you know several of them are almost non-audible. I think Sly fell into the whole 80s mentality with the Rambo and, and such and a uh, Rocky IV that I never appreciated. Okay. Simple and succinct. I try. Remaining thoughts for the week. There are a few films out that I am intrigued by, but some that I'm just, I'm having a difficult time wanting to go and see, like Civil War is one of them that I'm going, do I really want to see this? I know I should, but do I really want to, to spend my time doing it? Am I going to be upset when I come out? See, I, on the other hand, have absolutely no problem wanting to go see Challengers, or I'm pretty sure the Fall Guy opens this weekend, which is the weekend after we're recording, so it might be out by the time you're listening to this. I think either of those will be exceptional movies that I ha will have no problem enjoying. I don't know where your mileage necessarily varies as someone in your age bracket. You like to think that you have um, stayed young and hip, but uh, you, you definitely show your age a few times when it comes to modern movies and what's coming out and what you will and won't see. That being said, I also have the things that I just I won't personally see. And I'm a little bit divided on Civil War myself, having very little interest in seeing it on a big screen. I think it will work just fine at, at home on TV, but maybe that's just me. Yeah, Challenges looks uh, interesting, and I think I would go to see that. And the Fall Guy, because I remember the TV show, I'm, I'm gung-ho about that. And it is playing in theaters in Wisconsin Rapids over the weekend. Well, I think that would be something we should potentially do. Thank you all for bearing with us through an episode that I, I think has been a lot longer than I would have necessarily intended. But I think we had a fairly good discussion. So that'll do it for us this week. Thank you for listening. I knew from the first moment I saw you that you were dangerous to me. Next week, for our 210th episode, we welcome Andrew Corns of the Revisionist Almanac on to discuss a movie title that we've all become more familiar with over the past eight years, but you likely have not seen, Gaslight from 1944. Directed by George Cukor, written by John Van Druten, Walter Reisch, and John Balderston, and music by Bronislaw Caper. You won't want to miss that one, so watch ahead of the show by searching the Real Good app to find where it's streaming for you. That's R-E-E-L-G-O-O-D. Please like, follow, rate, and review, or whatever on whichever platform you have so that more can join in on our fun. You can also email the show at the new com or at greatest all time movie podcast at gmail.com, or you can find us at YouTube, Instagram, X, Letterboxd, or TikTok at the handle at Gmode Podcast. The greatest movie of all time is a production of Brian Duncan Studios. Our show is mixed, edited, and written by Thomas Duncan. Our music is thanks to Purple Planet Music. Our technical provider and distributor is Captivate FM.